As lockdown continues, so does our special lockdown series. While production is temporarily paused for our regular Never Too Small episodes, we're excited to offer you a different kind of inspiration for your time at home. Once again, we're collaborating with our talented friends, YouTubers, and favorite architects and designers to bring you episode two of Small Living. Thank you to our community for the kind messages of support and appreciation for our launch episode of Small Living. In this episode, minimalist Benita Larsen in Stockholm shares her tips and ideas on how to organize our small spaces. Jason from Plant Society returns to show us how to take care of our plants at home. Our London contributor, Celeste, chats to award-winning designer, Nicholas Gurney, and answers some of our audience questions. First up, Sharon from The Fermentary shares some quick and easy fermentation experiments suitable for even the smallest of kitchens. Hi, I'm Sharon, the founder of The Fermentary. We're here at the Rain House in Musk, and I'm going to talk to you about wild fermentation. Pickles now is something that you buy on the shelf in the store and that is vinegary. What seems to be magical to me is that whenever you brine something with just a salt, water and let it sit, you get the same beautiful sour flavour. It's a little more subtle and sometimes a little fizzy, but it feels really good in your gut as opposed to a vinegared preserved vegetable. I think the most popular ones that I've found with not just children, by the way, everybody, are the dill flavoured beans and just carrot sticks. So it's as easy as this, popping your beans into a, obviously a really clean jar. We're trying to create an environment that's inviting bacteria to, to be here. We don't want to kill it off. So hot water, really hot water is enough. So I'm just going to pop my beans in here. The next thing is, flavour is important. A lot of dill is beautiful in your beans. And in fact, uh, we call these dilly beans. It's quite common. Rather than garlic, I've got these beautiful corns of garlic. Amazing. I'm going to use those in here. I think I'll grab another one. Oh, you could put peppercorns, um, mustard seeds, coriander seeds, whatever you like. But in this case, I've just got garlic and dill. And then here's my water, one litre of water. I measured this out earlier and this tablespoon measures to about 30 grams. So I'm going to stir it in the water first. So for this particular ferment, for the onions, cauliflower, celery, the percentage of salt water is 3%. 3% of a litre of water is about a big full tablespoon of salt. While that's dissolving, I'll do my carrots. There's one little challenge aspect is that you want to make sure that the veggie stays beneath the brine. Nothing will go bad really, but sometimes you can attract calm yeast, K-A-H-M, and it's not dangerous, it's not going to make you sick, but it can, um, it's like a little white film that can grow on top and it can be off-putting to beginners. It can also make the veg a little bit softer and slimy. If you see it happening, you can actually tip that brine out and start again. And this, what's really good about this is it's fast. So you could make these on a Monday for Saturday, they'll be ready. I might put this nasturtium leaf in there, give it a little bit of a radishy flavour. Maybe a garlic clove. I don't seem to have a lot sitting here, so I'm just going to keep it really simple. Maybe a bit of dill. Pop it up the top there. All right. Pour my brine over. Exactly the right amount. Because there's going to be a lot of action happening now. And gases. So you want a way that the gas can get out but no air can get in. I love an airlock lid, and there are so many kinds of airlock lids you can get. This is just a simple airlock lid system. And the beauty of this one is that when it's finished and ready, I can take that lid off, this contraption, and put on a regular lid and pop it into the fridge. The way that you stop the fermentation is by refrigeration. All right, so I've got this lid, I'm gonna pop it on. I'm gonna put my airlock in there, actually, first. And there's a little bit of water left, so I'm going to pour some water in here. Don't let this, this looks a little more sciencey than it is, okay? It's just, it's just two tubes and when air comes out, it'll go bloop, bloop, bloop 
and this water is stopping air from getting in. There we go. And there we go. That's it, that's a brined veg. And uh, the main thing to remember is this is a faster ferment than say sauerkraut or other vegetables. So when you brine something after about five to six days, take the lid off and try one. And if it's ready and sour and good, put it in the fridge, you're done. And it can stay in the fridge for months. Hey, so if you're curious to learn more, you can find my book, Ferment for Good. The website's full of recipes, stories, things you can buy to help you on your way. Uh, there's a lot of stuff being added to it all the time. So check us out there at thefermentary.com.au and I'll see you next time. My name is Benita Larsson. I'm from Stockholm, Sweden. I create videos for my namesake channel on minimalism, organization and the Scandinavian lifestyle. I'm excited to be making a series of videos in collaboration with Never Too Small. I'm not much of a chef, but I do enjoy having my kitchen drawers organized. It just makes every day so much easier. Before organizing a space, I like to get everything out in the open to assess what I have. Then I sort like items with like and anything that doesn't belong in the drawer or that can be done away with is removed. I like using felt to line my kitchen drawers. It prevents things from rattling around when you pull and push the drawers. I got mine online and similar can be found on Amazon and at IKEA. On top of the felt I use drawer organizers. I got these wooden ones locally but there are tons of options on Amazon. You can also most likely shop your home and find things you already have. I've used bread pans, shoe boxes, candy containers and trays to keep my kitchen doors organized in the past. When things go in the drawer I consider the size obviously so they fit in each section but also how I use them. Most often use items at the front of the drawer and less often use that towards the back. For more videos like this, visit my channel Benita Larsson, where I share all things Scandinavian from my apartment here in Stockholm and beyond. Hi, I'm Jason Chong, co-founder of The Plant Society, and today I hope to inspire you to bring more plants into your home. In small spaces, we're always concerned about how much space our plants and furniture take up. So here we have some plants that won't grow too big and are perfect for dining tables, window sills, as well as benches. Um, we've got Peperomia obtusifolia, um, which is, has glossy leaves and also really compact. We've also got Ripsalis, which is a rainforest succulent. Um, so these can be pruned back as well if they get too big. Um, one of my favorites is the Hoya. So these have a vining nature. Um, but they can stay in smaller pots as well. We've also got another type of peperomia. Um, you can see that they've got very different foliage. Um, so within the families, you can really find that they've all got a range of different characteristics, um, which will suit your different um, styles at home as well. So these generally will like brighter light. Um, if you do have lower light, you're best to try the Hoya, but the peperomia and the Ripsalis will prefer brighter light. Everyone is always nervous about maintaining their plants. Um, here today I'll show you how simple it is. I don't think that maintaining your plants should be difficult. And there's a few simple steps to make sure your plants stay healthy um, throughout the year as well. The main thing is to make sure your plants are clean and that will prevent any pests and diseases. Um, so you can use a simple cloth that has a bit of grit to it and that easily, um, when it's wet, will help clean off any excess dust on the foliage. You'll find being indoors, they collect a lot of dust through circulating air through vents. Um, by cleaning the leaves, it will allow the leaves to breathe better as well. This is easy if you've got um, larger leaf foliage. However, when you look at foliage like this or like this chordatum here, um, it might be easier to take it into the shower to wash it down um, or a mister. So we're simply trying to simulate the rain and that will clean off any dust on the foliage as well. 
Um, so when it comes to plant maintenance, think about how the natural environment cleans um, our environment, and that's generally rain, wind, to get off any dust. And you can see that um, all the dust is just washing off there. Another thing to do is to make sure over time that you flush out the soil as well. So what that means is that toxins gradually filter through and build up. So it's good to flood the pot in the sink and that will allow the toxins to wash out as well. Once you've done that, it's a good time as well to also prune off any dead foliage. Um, this can be done regularly as well, but always make sure the area above the soil is clean um, to avoid um, any homes for pests and diseases. So similarly, we will do the same thing here and remove any dead foliage. And this can be done on a weekly basis, or if you don't have as much time, you might want to do it every uh, month or so. Perfect. Um, and we can mist this one down again. Um, and that will keep your plants healthy in you know, indoor environments that don't have good airflow. Um, and also when they do collect dust, you want to let them breathe once again. And in turn, they will help purify the air as well. Thanks for tuning in to learn more about greenery within your home. If you are after more information, head to our website. It's www.theplantsociety.com.au. Nicholas Gurney's work needs little introduction. Uh, never too small viewers will remember the gold artist studio and kitchen from The Warren and Nick's signature minimalist approach to his 5S Tara and Yardsticks projects. Nick, thank you so much for taking some time to speak with us today. Pleasure, Celeste. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Um, I'd like to go back to before you began your design practice. What initially drew you to pursue a career in design? Um, I mean, this is going back a little while now to when you're much younger and you sort of don't really know exactly where you want to go, or where you're going to end up. But I definitely knew that I had some level of creativity about me. I was very interested in, um, in how people live and in interior design, but um, I felt industrial design um, was a, a better fit for me at the time. Um, so I studied uh, in industrial design. How does your industrial design background um, inform your design process? My, my work um, is, is very much informed by my industrial design background. I'm most interested in um, functionalism, very utilitarian interiors. I see small spaces as a series of products that come together to make somebody's life better. A series of small industrial design insertions in a greater whole being an apartment space or a house. Yeah, I, I view the design of spaces as, as a series of industrial design pieces. You do do a lot of uh, small spaces in your practice. Um, is this something um, that, you know, you've actively chosen to pursue? Uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, it comes back again to that idea that um, I, I realised very early on, I think it was about the time that I chose to go and live in the middle of the city, um, and about the time that I became fascinated with how people lived, I realised that we would be living in a period of reduction going forward. In, in every facet of our lives, we would need to reduce um, our footprint on the planet. And, and that starts at home, I think. We need to stop the, the constant urban sprawl. Uh, we need to make better use of things that we have. And all of these things that are related, for me, to need rather than to want or to vanity, these are things that, these are things that we need. I want to work in a space... Um, where we solve problems um, for need rather than purely for want. How do you approach the challenge of maximising living in a small space? You know, we talk about um, a lot more people sort of moving towards smaller spaces or, or living in urban environments. How do you make the most of those kinds of, of living environments? When I enter a small space, um, it's immediately obvious for me that the, um, the answer or the solutions are already inherent within that space. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that, you know, if you have a very tall space, then you don't need to use the walls. You use the floor or you use the, the ceiling space. Uh, and if you have a space with a very small footprint and very small ceiling heights, then you need to be very careful not to put too much stuff on the walls. You know, immediately um, the design of small spaces sort of unwraps itself um, simply by being in the space and listening to the space. 
And, and what are some considerations that come with designing small spaces, ceiling height being one, floor space being another? I imagine light and material would play a big role here too. Absolutely. I mean, in, in the case of um, the Tara apartment, for instance, um, there was a single window in the space. So in, in that particular instance, we decided to um, embrace the notion of a studio and, and not employ any delineation in the space uh, and instead um, insert a sort of an almost white shroud around that singular window so that it would bounce all of the light into the space. You know, in, in the case, for instance, of the 5S apartment, um, it had a very small footprint, but they needed really great storage requirements. So rather than employ a whole mass of storage units dotted around the apartment, we instead employed very deep storage units um, so that it meant that it, it put all of the storage in a cluster and it didn't detract from the feeling of space. You know, in urban centres, as, as they become busier, we see an increase in multi-generational housing as well. You know, young people are constantly or consistently being locked out of the market. Older people are at risk of isolation. Um, your project Yardsticks is a fabulous example of, of backyard architecture, you might call it. Can you tell us some more about this project? Because this is quite different from sort of the apartment living that you've previously worked on. For a long time, we built um, big houses in the suburbs on, on big blocks. Um, and the backyards um, are underutilised. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to um, resist the sort of cheap and cheerful granny flat, but rather we wanted to create a home that people could be proud of um, and could be beautiful and could be functional um, and could be tailored to a specific block um, in an underutilised backyard space. I particularly enjoyed the lime-washed ply interiors. You know, what materials are you drawn to? Probably very obviously I like humble materials. Um, hard wearing materials and primarily inexpensive materials because these materials tend to be made of renewable resources. Um, they tend to be less um, manufactured in comparison to um, precious materials. I mean, it all comes back to having a, a sustainable grounding for each project. In the Warren particularly, I mean, we've seen a quite unusual use of material. There's a central artist pod that is clad in mirrored gold sheeting and it sort of creates this really interesting glow throughout the apartment and and similarly in tara um you know the the function was clad in in metal do you look for uh materials that have a, a different point or, or how did you specify these materials and and what do you look for other than sort of um i guess low intervention we might say in materials for me the the, the finishes right there um that's the face of, of the space, right? It's, it's, it's the presentation. Um, so once, once the, um, the amenity is realised and the spatial organisation is realised, you can dress up the space. Um, I think too often we, we think about aesthetics too early, um, just purely for the point of applying materials. Um, but when, you've, when, when the spatial organisation and the utility um, is settled upon, you then can um, make a correlation between the owner and their personality and then and then apply materials to that and in the case of the warren um, there was so much personality in the space um, i wanted to reflect that um, and it seemed logical to use a mirror when I, I came across the gold mirror i knew that he would absolutely love it and it, it does just that it reflects his personality he loves it and you are um in your flinders lane apartment as well another material use that i really loved was the sort of corrugated was it like a corrugated glass in the bathroom it's actually a plastic, uh, oh. so again, it's, it's very inexpensive, but it looks quite expensive. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's translucent, so the idea is that we can borrow light from a space um, that has plenty of light because the bathroom in, in the Flinders Lane apartment had no light, no access to light. So it, it, it had the dual purpose of providing light and, and privacy at the same time. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It was fantastic to get your insights. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Next episode, we'll speak to Nina Tolstrup from Studio Mama in London and share some more ideas for your time at home. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell to receive updates on our next episode. For more detail on the features within small living, go to www.nevertosmall.com.